The coffee maker's broken? Seriously? This video is for business owners, managers, and human resources professionals that want to avoid employee lawsuits. I'm going to give you a broad overview of modern employment law from an attorney's perspective, but I'm not going to throw a bunch of legal BS at you and I'm not going to hedge every statement like most lawyers. I'm going to give you actionable insights on how to avoid getting sued in every major area of employment law. Now, I am an employment lawyer in California, but this video isn't just for people in California. It's for all 50 these states, but it's not legal advice. If you need actual legal advice, contact an employment lawyer in your state. If you're in California, feel free to contact me. Okay, with that said, let's get this party started. Employment law is a gargantuan body of law. That's why this video is so long but it can be broken down into 12 bite-sized subcategories. Employment contracts, torts in the workplace, wages and hours, discrimination, harassment, leaves of absence, workplace safety, unfair competition, unemployment, layoffs, collective bargaining agreements, and everything else. But before we start getting into each of these, I'm gonna give you the number one way to prevent employment lawsuits. I've said this a thousand times and I'm gonna say it a thousand more. Employees do not file lawsuits because the law was broken. They file lawsuits because they feel that they were treated like garbage. Treat your employees with dignity, respect, and fairness. And in my opinion, you'll avoid almost all lawsuits even if you've inadvertently broken the law. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you know somebody who would benefit from watching this video, please share it with them. I also recommend that you subscribe to my channel. That way you'll be notified when I make more videos in the future. Do we have any red vines? The red vines are gone? Oh. Number one, employment contracts. Typically when an employee is hired, they sign a bunch of paperwork, most likely an employee handbook. But that's not a contract of binding them to the employer in the way we traditionally think of contracts. No, most employees are at will, meaning they can quit at any time, and for the most part, employers can fire them for almost any reason at almost any time. Now, where the vast majority of the litigation in employment contracts is, and where the vast majority of the money spent by company is, is over salesperson agreements. Salespeople have commission agreements, usually written commission agreements, hopefully, where it says how much money they're gonna get paid for the number of widgets that they sell. Where people get in trouble, where companies get in trouble is when they tinker with that in the middle of a sales cycle or in the middle of a sales agreement, period. Lots of salespeople are type A and they do not like when the rules of the game are changed under their feet. So don't tinker with the sales agreements except for when it's time to rewrite them and you will drastically reduce your chance of getting sued by your sales folks. Number two, torts in the workplace. Okay, a tort is simply the infringement of a right. And in the context of employment law, there's four big ones that are where all the money is spent. Number one, wrongful termination. We've all heard the term, but really most people don't know what it means. So basically wrongful termination is when an employer fires an employee in violation of a state specific law. Okay, I'll give you an example. In California, it's unlawful for an employer to fire an employee because they complained about unlawful harassment or an unsafe working environment or price fixing. So the easy action step is don't fire an employee soon after they make a complaint about something that is protected by your state law. So do a, do a little bit of due diligence and research on your state law and then just hit the pause button before you fire somebody and consult with somebody who knows what they're talking about. Okay, number two is defamation. Now this is common in former employees. What do I mean by that? So here's the scenario. An employee is fired by you, by your company, and then is looking for a new job. A prospective employer contacts your company and says, why was John fired? And then you say, because he embezzled $10,000 or, or misquoted something by $100,000. 
If the employee, the former employee, has some sort of evidence or credible argument to say what you told the prospective employer is false, leading to them not getting the job, they've now got a defamation lawsuit against you and it's a very sad day. Number three is privacy. Pay attention to your state privacy laws. This is not where a ton of money is spent, but it will be a lot of money if you're infringing a lot of employees' privacy rights at work. Number four, and this is a biggie, misrepresentation. Okay, the situation is as follows. You put out a job advertisement or you make representations as to what a job is going to be. And then somebody quits their job, comes to work for your company based on those job advertisements or those representations, which turn out not to be true. Here's an easy example. Let's say you told somebody the job is going to pay $100,000. But when they show up, you say, no, it only pays $40,000. They're going to sue you for misrepresentation and it's going to be a sad day. So make sure you work with HR to make sure everything that's in the job advertisement is accurate and correct. Number three, the wages that people earn and the hours that they work or wage and hour law. Without question, the big dog here is unpaid overtime. And here's how it plays out. If you're an employer and you inadvertently fail to pay an employee 15 minutes of overtime pay a day, for example, and that accumulates day by day by day because your policy or your pay system makes it happen, then three years down the road, that's a very sizable chunk of money that the employee can go after you for. So you wanna make sure you know your state laws on overtime very well, and they change from state to state, and that you follow them as close as possible. Now this can get really scary when you group a lot of employees together and they file a class action. And it becomes especially scary when, if you lose in a wage and hour case, you're also going to pay attorney fees on top of the judgment. So this is a, an area of law that you need to be very careful and you need to pay very close attention to what your state laws are. All right, number two is off the clock work. This is very common where somebody is working for the employer benefit yet they're not on the clock. And usually it's in small amounts. Like they show up 15 minutes before they clock in for their shift or it's a requirement that they show up or they work during their lunch break, or you ask them to run errands after they clock out for the day. Again, if you, if you accumulate a lot of people and a lot of violations over the course of a long period of time, this can become a large class action. Third, bonuses, tips, uh, unreimbursed expenses, mileage. Pay attention to those rules because they add up over time. Fourth, and this is primarily when we're talking about individual lawsuits, is when an employer says to an employee, okay, I've hired you for this job and I'm gonna pay you a salary. Yet the job duties that that person is required to do dictate by state law that they be paid by the hour, hourly. They're a non-exempt employee. Well, then if they're being paid a salary, they're not earning overtime for all the hours over 40 in a week. And they're not getting lunch breaks and all the benefits that come with being a non-exempt employee. So that can add up over time and they can get really expensive, even just for one person if you accidentally or inadvertently or intentionally misclassify somebody. Number four, discrimination. Title VII, which is the federal anti-discrimination and employment law, prohibits discrimination by employers against employees or prospective employees on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, and religion. Now that's the federal minimum. Your state probably, like my state does, has additional protected characteristics that your state's legislature has said are prohibited means for termination or refusal to hire. So pay attention to your state's anti-discrimination and employment law. In California, you can look at the Fair Employment and Housing Act, and it lays them all out very clearly in the big statute. Um, the big three in terms of money spent in this area are race, age, and disability discrimination. Race is fairly self-explanatory, so I'm not going to get into it. Historically, we very much understand that. Age is a little bit more nuanced. Typically, this law protects people over the age of 40. You can't fire somebody because they're over the age of 40 and replace them with a 20-year-old because they have more energy. That's going to look really bad in a court of law. So make sure if you're terminating some 
somebody over the age of 40 and you're replacing them with somebody who's significantly younger, you need to make sure you've got documented, clear reasons why that's happening that have nothing to do with their age. The third and by far the biggest, in my opinion, is disability discrimination. Uh, and this is nuanced because it's not just hiring, firing, it's also accommodating. Do you need to provide your disabled employee a reasonable accommodation? If they request time off to go see a doctor, do you have to accommodate that? If they ask for modified job duties, do you have to accommodate that? And if you don't think that they can do the job duties that you've lined out in your job description or you've told that employee because their disability prohibits them from doing it, can you fire them? This gets really complicated, really messy, and that's why I would say the majority of dis discrimination cases that my office handles and most lawyers now handle are disability discrimination cases. Number five, harassment. Remember when I talked about respect, dignity, and fairness? That's where this really starts to pay off. Because aside from the large class actions, in my opinion, harassment cases pose the largest risk to organizations in terms of dollars than any other type of case in employment law. And the reason is because if an employee has a solid case against an employer for harassment, they're gonna be putting forth evidence in front of a jury in a public forum that shows truly atrocious, atrocious and sustained conduct uh, by the harasser. You don't wanna be defending that. You don't wanna have anything to do with that. So the actionable insight is really simple. You can avoid most harassment cases if you manage your managers. And what I mean by that is most harassment is done by a manager who does not feel like there's gonna be any consequences, that they don't have any oversight over them, or they don't feel like they have oversight over them. So they kind of just do whatever they want. So if you properly train your managers and that they that you show that the managers, that there's oversight over them, that they're gonna, they feel like they could get in trouble if they don't behave properly, then they're gonna be far less likely to engage in harassment type behavior. Now, a good warning sign that you should be aware of is if you're getting complaints by employees about bullying. Bullying is not illegal, right? It's perfectly legal to bully somebody in an employment context. It's wrong, but it's legal. But that should be a large warning sign to you because usually if somebody believes they're bullied, they're gonna call a lawyer. And that lawyer is gonna be the one who's gonna ask that employee a whole bunch of questions. And if the lawyer is talented enough and there's the lawyer gets lucky, they're gonna be able to tie that bullying behavior to a protected characteristic and pursue a harassment case. And it's gonna be a sad day for your company. Number six, leaves of absence. This is a complicated area of law. At its basic level, uh, in the olden days, companies would just fire people if they couldn't come one day, right? Um, so the federal government and the state governments recognizing a need for a stable workforce and predictable employment pass laws that permit people to take temporary leaves of absence from companies while that company holds the job open for them so when they come back they can resume their work without being fired. Um, that's the basic premise. Now the big law in the country is called the Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA. That's the primary one people think about it uh, as maternity leave law, but it's, it's broader than that. It applies to disabilities uh, and, and certain other types of leaves of absence. So you first want to find out whether or not FMLA even applies to your company. You secondly want to find out if there's any state laws that apply to your company because uh, like most areas of employment law, there's a federal law, there's a state law, and they overlap and sometimes contradict each other. So make sure you, if, if an employee of yours wants to take a leave of absence and you're unsure whether or not you have to do it and you don't want to do it, make sure you consult with a professional about it before you decide to give uh, the leave of absence or deny the leave of absence. Number seven, workplace safety. Uh, number one, get workers' compensation insurance if you don't have it. Don't be dumb. Get it. Number two, take workplace safety very seriously. If your industry has heavy OSHA regulations, find out what they are and follow them. Don't try to circumvent them. Don't cut off the safety mechanisms off the machines. Just do what OSHA says and follow the proper safety protocols. Where workplace safety can get 
extra painful for an employer is if an employee comes and complains about a, an unsafe working environment and then the company retaliates against that employee um, for that complaint. That's where we get into whistleblower type cases, um, but the reality is it, it, you'll avoid all of this if you make safety a priority, so do it. I wonder if we have any donuts. Number eight, unfair competition. Now, the first under this is the duty of loyalty. Now, there's not a lot to say about this aside from the fact that employees generally have a duty of loyalty while they're working for a company. So they really shouldn't be out competing against the company while they're working for it. The duty of loyalty varies from state to state and it's not something you take action on. I just think it's a great reminder to give to employees now and again. The second is uh, trade secret litigation. This is where all the money is spent in this area of law. Well, what is a trade secret? Well, we've all heard about famous trade secrets like the Coca-Cola formula, but in most everyday contexts, it's a system or a process or a customer list or some type of invention that a company has made that it keeps secret. If you patent something, it's not a secret anymore. So it's something that you keep secret from all your competitors and from the public eye. Um, and if an employee who works at your company, who knows that information, then takes it and uses it against you or uses it to benefit somebody else, some other company, you could file a lawsuit against them. Now, the practical insight on how to avoid all this from happening in the first place is to, at the beginning of employment, give the employee a document that shows exactly what the trade secrets are, uh, identifies them by name and what they are, and tells the employee that they're a trade secret, they're confidential, and they cannot be disclosed to anybody even after they quit. That, you have that document identified, acknowledged, and signed by the employee, and that would help you immensely in enforcing uh, a temporary restraining order or a lawsuit against the employee down the road. The third category here are non-compete agreements. There's not a lot to say about them. In some parts of the country, like California, they're almost completely void and unlawful. So figure out what your state's non-compete laws are and make sure you abide by them if you're putting them in employee contracts. Before I get to the final four, I want to say something I think is very important. If you need actual legal advice, don't put any information in the comment section below. You want that information to be privileged. Therefore, reach out to an employment lawyer in your state. If you are in California, you're more than welcome to reach out to me directly via email or my phone number. However, just note, I, I'm a professional. I have a family. I have obligations. I'm not going to respond to a bunch of people asking for free legal advice. I don't give free legal advice. I do give free consultations, but there's a difference. The final four subjects, I lumped them all together, not because they're not important. They're very important, but because they kind of fall outside the scope of what an everyday business owner, uh, manager, or HR professional can do to prevent employment lawsuits. Um, but real quickly, unemployment largely is an administrative thing. Somebody uh, applies for uh, labor board benefits for unemployment benefits benefits and then the company has to respond to that. Not a big dollar spend in the context of employment law. Uh, secondly, if we're talking about layoffs, if you're going to lay off a lot of people at one time, you might need to comply with the WARN Act, so contact a professional for advice on that. Um, third, collective bargaining agreements. Oh my gosh, that's way outside the scope of this video. Unions, grievance procedures, union contract negotiations, uh, kind of that's the labor law, traditionally uh, discussed as labor law. Uh, finally, arbitration and insurance. Arbitration is a super hot topic. It's about whether or not you can prevent employees from filing lawsuits in court. Do they have to go to a private judge, which is scary for an employee not to be in a public forum, but it's very expensive for the employer because they have to pay for a private judge. Uh, finally, insurance is about what kind of insurance uh, companies can uh, can buy in order to protect themselves from employment disputes like employment practices, liability insurance, or EPLI to protect against discrimination and harassment claims. All right, that's the basics. As you probably can imagine by now, there's a whole lot more to employment law than what I've said in this basic overview, but I think this got the job done. If you think I missed something, you have a question about something that I said, if you disagree with something that I said, or you want to request a video on a particular subject in the future, that's what the comment section is for. Leave comments. I will respond to them. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.